this in humbling introduction, I think I'd rather hear John MacArthur myself, so <laughs> though I do write all of his sermons. Uh, not <laughs> People are always bringing his books up and asking me to sign his books, you know, and I said, it's enough that I wrote them <laughs> now that I have to sign them. Uh, yeah, I was at Shepherd's Conference um, where I preach each year, and I was, uh, I guess a year and a half ago, and I was in a restaurant, and there was this beehive of men, uh, about 14, 16 men from this church and maybe a few foreigners, and um, and they were just so full of energy, and they sent someone over to talk to me, and, and I was just immediately drawn to, they had like three or four tables merged together, and and I went over and just immediately felt a kindred spirit with uh, the men in your church. And they were so enthusiastic for the things of the Lord that my heart was just drawn to them. And so they said, you've got to come and, and preach. And so I said, well, in God's good timing, we'll see how we can work this out. And so um, uh, the Lord has smiled upon me to allow me to, to be here with you. And to, we had the Expositors Institute. Yeah, we had some 80 men. And they, they really came from all over. They came from multiple states as well as here locally. And it was a wonderful time. And so we're just trying to light as many fires as we can around the country and overseas um, for the preaching of the Word of God. Uh, the church has always been strongest when the Word has been expounded. Uh, the high watermarks of church history have been those times when God has raised up the strongest men to preach the strongest message and those low ebbs in church history when there's been a famine in the land for the hearing of the word of the Lord has been when God has withheld his servants to go and preach the word really as a judgment upon the land because they have rejected the word of God. And so it's our prayer in this day that God will restore the pulpit for the preaching of the Word of God, because as the pulpit goes, so eventually goes the church. As the church goes, so eventually goes the world. And so the most strategic shot to reach the world is to strike as many pulpits as possible with um, a charge to take the Word of God and to open it and proclaim it. Well, that's the very thing I want to do with you today. So if you take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 1, and I want to speak to you this morning on the glorious gospel of God. Romans chapter 1. I want to begin by reading the text, the passage, and we're going to have to move quickly because I see my friend the clock there on the back wall, and I've got a lot to unpack, and, um, and so we're going to need to move. Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart, here's our focus, for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David, according to the flesh, who was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. Christ. We are living in days of unprecedented evil. As we are watching the very moral fiber of our nation unraveling like a cheap sweater before our very eyes. The recent ruling by the Supreme Court on same-sex marriage will be a dam break of immorality such as we have never seen upon our land. 
this post-Christian society will be imploding. The sin that once hid in a back corner is now parading and strutting down Main Street. And this is but the tip of the iceberg of the problems that are facing us as a people on every side, politically, judicially, legislatively, morally, racially, maritally, parent, parentally, educationally, personally. And there is only one solution. For the crisis that is confronting us. And at the deepest level, it is not changing the laws. At the deepest, deepest level, it is not fixing the economy or creating new jobs. It is not stopping ISIS. It is not solving the immigration debacle. These are only symptoms of the disease. At the deepest level, there is only one cure for the multiplying, mounting problems that now plague the land. That one cure is the gospel of Jesus Christ, which alone can address the real problem of the human heart. And this is precisely what Paul was facing in the first century with the evil empire known as the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire had become a virtual cesspool of iniquity. The Caesars of Rome had become cruel tyrants who demanded to be worshipped and who abused their power. Uh, the Greek ideology and philosophy and, and worldview with man in the center was dominating the mindset of the day. And Paul had no reverse gear in him. Paul wanted to go to, the, go to Rome, to the very nerve center of the empire, to the seat of political and military power. And Paul wanted to go to Rome not to lobby Caesar and not to boycott the palace and not to picket the senate, such would have only been putting band-aids on the cancer. Paul longed to go to Rome to put the gospel of Jesus Christ forward into the marketplace of the ideologies of the day in order to capture the hearts of men and women, both the high as well as the lowly, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because Paul understood that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And there is no power on human earth that compares to the power of the gospel to explode in the hearts and in the souls of men and women and to totally transform them from the inside out. The word gospel, euangelion, means the good news. Angel is in the middle of this Greek word, euangelion, angel, messenger, euangelion, you, E-U, like you give a eulogy, means good. It is the good message of the salvation that is from God to a lost and perishing world that is a planet under judgment, a planet that is about to be engulfed in the wrath of God that will consume sinners throughout all of the ages to come. And Paul will go on to say in this very chapter in verse 18, for the wrath of God is, present tense, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men. And there was only one hope for the Roman Empire, and that hope was in the saving message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I want you to know there is only one hope for this nation in which you and I live, and there is only one hope for every nation in the world, and it is the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So t this morning, I, I want to remind us of some very basic truths about the gospel 
of Jesus Christ. Number one, I want you to see the source of the gospel. In verse one, Paul begins by identifying from whence this gospel comes. Uh, Paul writes in verse one, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle. And what he is doing here is he is identifying himself as the messenger of this gospel. And so the question is, where has this gospel come from? He says, for the gospel of God. The gospel of God does not mean the gospel about God, though the gospel is about God. All the attributes of God are put on fullest display in the gospel of Christ. But grammatically and exegetically, this means the gospel that has come from God. In other words, the gospel has come down from above. It has come down from God. God is the source of the gospel. He is the author of the gospel. He is the architect of the gospel. And it is not arisen from the, from the culture. It, it is not the result of the pooling of the best minds of men in the church or any denomination or any seminary. Instead, this gospel is God's solution to the human dilemma. And no political solution can ever solve a spiritual problem. And at the very heart, our problems are spiritual problems. And no legislation and no politics and no finance and no education can ever solve the problems that are plaguing this land. There is only one solution, and that is the spiritual solution of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So at the very beginning, at the front doorstep of this book, Paul makes this dramatic statement that the source of the gospel is God himself. To reject the gospel is to reject God. To receive the gospel is to receive the mercy and the grace of of God. Now, second, we must move quickly. I want you to note, secondly, the exclusivity of the gospel. Please note the definite article in verse 1 before the word gospel. It is the gospel of God. Now, please note, it is not a gospel as if there are many gospels, as if there are many ways to God as if there are many solutions that have come down from heaven for man. No, this says that the gospel is the gospel. There is no other gospel but the gospel. In verse 9, it is referred to as the gospel. In verse 15, it is the gospel. In verse 16, it is the gospel. Anywhere in the pages of Scripture... When the gospel is referred to, it is always the gospel because it is the only way of salvation and it is the only solution that has come from the infinite genius mind of God to solve the human dilemma. That is why Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. Jesus claims an exclusive monopoly on all access to the Father. Peter said before the Sanhedrin, there is salvation in no other name. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And Paul wrote to Timothy and said, there is one God and one mediator between God and man the man Christ Jesus. So as Paul begins this letter, he wants the Romans to know, he wants you to know, he wants me to know that this is the one and only plan that God has for the dilemma of the human race. This is the only solution to the problems that are confronting us at the deepest level. It is in the gospel of God. Now, third, I want you to see the continuity of the gospel. As we look at verse 
two, what I want you to note is that this is not a new message that has burst onto the scene in the first century. Uh, This is not a new plan to come from the throne of God. This is not plan B, as though plan A did not work, and so God now must come up with an appendix to add to His eternal purpose and plan. No, please note the continuity, the antiquity, if you will, of the gospel. In verse 2, we read, which, that's an impersonal pronoun referring back to the gospel, which he, God, promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. What this is saying is that the gospel of Jesus Christ was proclaimed throughout the entirety of the Old Testament, that from the very dawn of human history, In the Garden of Eden, there was the proto-euangelion, the first mention of the gospel. As God revealed, God himself spoke to the serpent, and God said that there will be from the seed of the woman one who will crush the head of the serpent. He will bruise him on his heel, but this coming seed of the woman will crush the works of the devil Later in the garden, God himself then slew an innocent animal and clothed uh, Adam and Eve with these very coverings. And it was a foreshadowing at the very dawn of human history of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the entire sacrificial system that was designed by God was to be a, 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 a foreshadowing of the gospel of, of God in Christ. Every sacrifice that was offered was a picture of the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. And every priest who stood between the people and God was but a picture of the one great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, who would come and make intercession for His people. It can, has been well said that the 39 books of the Old Testament are 39 mountain peaks all pointing upward to Christ and to God. And it, all of this, it says, recorded in the Scripture from Moses to Malachi. Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 says, God spoke long ago to the fathers in many portions and in many ways. This continuity of the gospel means there is no new way of salvation. Uh, The gospel in the Old Testament is the gospel in the New Testament. There is not a way for the Jews to be saved in the Old Testament that is different from Gentiles in the New Testament. Everyone who has ever been saved in the history of the world has been saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, And there are no exceptions to this whatsoever. Uh, There are not many ways to God in the Old Testament. There is only one way to God, and there is only one way in the New Testament. And it is the same in both Testaments. It is through the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is perfect continuity from the Old Testament to the New Testament. There is perfect unity between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The antiquity of the Old Testament is carried forward in the New Testament, and they both testify like two lips speaking the same message of the exclusivity of salvation in Jesus Christ. Please understand that in these days, there is no other hope in any other religion, in any other philosophy, in any other ideology, there are many roads that lead to hell. There is only one road that leads to heaven, and it is the bloody cross of Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to note fourth, as we continue to walk our way through this text, we've seen the source of the gospel. It's the gospel of God. We've seen the exclusivity of the gospel. It is the gospel. And we have seen the antiquity or the continuity of the gospel. 
It is the same in both testaments. So much I want to say under that point, but I must move on. Fourth, I want you to now see the subject of the gospel. What is the substance of the gospel? What is the essence of the gospel? I want you to see, beginning in verse 3 and extending to the beginning of verse 5, that in two words, the gospel is Jesus Christ, the person and work of Christ. Jesus Christ is the sum and the substance. He is the alpha and the omega of the gospel. The entire gospel is in Jesus Christ. And there is no gospel outside of the person and work of Jesus Christ. In verse 3, Paul talks about the person of Christ. In the truest sense, the gospel is not a plan. In the truest sense, the gospel is a person. It was not a plan who died upon the cross. It was the person of the Son of God, the Son of Man, who died upon Calvary's cross. And it is the plan that speaks of the person. So notice in verse 3, as he begins to now expand on what is the gospel. And every one of us here today must be crystal clear regarding what is the gospel. And what is the gospel? The answer is, it is who is the gospel. In verse 3, we see the person of Christ, both his deity and his humanity. Uh, Verse 3 begins concerning His Son. That is a reference to His deity. That identifies Christ as the Son of God, the eternal Son of the living God who is co-equal and co-eternal to God the Father. And then He speaks of the humanity of Christ. He says, "...who was born of a descendant of David." This speaks of the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ and that He was born of a woman, that He was sired by the Holy Spirit, that He was born under the law, that He became like us yet without sin. And He came according to the royal messianic lineage that had been set forth in the Old Testament who was born of a descendant of David. The path of the Messiah had been marked out from long ago, such that when he would appear upon the stage of human history, there would be no mistaking who he is. And Jesus came with all of the credentials necessary of the Messiah as he was the son of David, of the royal house of David. Isaiah 11 verse 1 had said that a a shoot will spring forth from the stem of Jesse, according to the flesh, and that refers to his human lineage. Jesus Christ was the Son of God and the Son of Man. He was fully God and he was fully man. He had to be in order to be our mediator upon the cross. A mediator is one who stands between two parties who have had a falling out. And there is an irreconcilable difference between them. And a mediator stands in the middle and he must be equal to both sides. And he must bring the two sides together and make reconciliation and make peace. That is why Jesus had to be fully God in order to represent God to us. And he had to be fully man in order to represent us to God. And it is only one who was fully God and fully man who could, in essence, take God by one hand and sinful man on the other hand and bring the two together and reconcile God to man and man to God through the blood of His cross. So that is why Paul emphasizes here the person of Christ. And then note, In verse 4, the proof of Christ. Verse 4 continues, who was declared the Son of God? Uh, This word declared is a very strong word. It it is the word from which we derive the English word horizon. 
That is to say, Jesus Christ has been marked out upon the landscape of human history. It is unmistakable. God has authenticated and validated and verified that His Son is the Savior of sinners. And how has He done this? Because during His life, His deity was veiled. He came in the form of a bondservant. He didn't look like a king. He did not look like Lord. How did God demonstrate ultimately the Messiahship and the Sonship of the Lord Jesus Christ? And the answer is by the resurrection of Christ from the dead. It is the ultimate apologetic. There is the empty tomb. Buddha has died and he's dead and his body is in the grave. Confucius has died and he is dead and in the grave. Brigham Young, Joseph Smith, Mary Baker Eddy, uh, uh, Mohammed, all of the religious leaders of the world have died and their bodies are, uh, and their bones are dead in the grave. But Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. He came walking out of that tomb, a risen, living, victorious Savior with the keys of death and life in His hands. And the resurrection of Christ was the validation from heaven. It was like God saying, Amen, this is my beloved Son, hear Him. Notice, according to the Spirit of holiness, that is saying that the Holy Spirit who conceived in the womb of Mary, the virgin birth, the Holy Spirit who anointed the Lord Jesus Christ with power from on high in His baptism, the Holy Spirit who filled Him, who led Him, who empowered Him, who sustained Him on the cross is the same Holy Spirit who raised Him from the dead. Now notice how He identifies Christ at the end of verse 4 with three names. Jesus Christ, our Lord. This is one of these wonderful times in Scripture where all three names of Christ are strung together. Understand this. Jesus is His saving name. Ma- Matthew 1, verse 21, You shall name, call His name Jesus, for He shall save His people from their sins. The name Jesus means Jehovah saves, God saves. And Jesus Christ was God come in the flesh to save his people from the wrath to come. Christ is his strong name. If Jesus is his saving name, Christ is his strong name. It means the anointed one. That's what the word Messiah means means the anointed one. That is what Christ means, the anointed one. Anointed by the power of the Holy Spirit and endued with the power of God from on high to carry out the mission that was given to him upon the earth. No one has ever been anointed and empowered like the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Lord is his sovereign name. God has therefore given him a name which is above every name, that those in heaven and on earth and under the earth, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is curios, that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And let me tell you, that was the rub in the first century because every citizen of the Roman Empire had to make this confession, Caesar is Lord. And at least once a year, they had to come and make a public homage of the deity of Caesar, and the Christians would not bow. And the Christians refused to give such allegiance to a mere man. And when put to the test, they would not buckle, and they stood strong in grace, and they said, Jesus is. Christ is Lord. These three names together are a beautiful and capture and summary of the fullness of Christ in his person. And then in verse 5, we've seen the person of Christ. 
and the proof of Christ in his resurrection, I want you to see the provision of Christ at the beginning of verse 5. It says, through whom, the whom refers to Christ, through whom we, that's referring to all believers, have received grace. It's referring to saving grace, sanctifying grace, strengthening grace, serving grace, sustaining grace, all the way down to dying grace. It is grace upon grace upon grace that has been lavished upon us. And this says that the entire river of grace that is cascading down from the throne of God to believers is coming to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. The Father is the source. The mediation is the Son. The application is by the Holy Spirit. There is not one drop of grace outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who has Christ has life. The one who does not have Christ does not have life, but abides in death. And so he says, through Christ, do you see that in verse 5? Through him, he is the exclusive mediator. He is the sole means and medium by which grace comes to us. We have received grace, and then he says, and apostleship, and for Paul that meant in a technical way, there were a few who were, who were apostles in the first century. They have long since passed off the scene, and in a general sense, we all have been called to be sent ones with the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the substance of the gospel. And the next time you have an opportunity to share the gospel of Christ with someone else, you open your mouth and you tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ who was born of a virgin, who lived a sinless and perfect life, who went to a cross and was lifted up to die in the place of sinners, who bore the wrath of God for our sins in himself through the shedding of his blood, who propitiated the right the righteous wrath of God toward us who would believe that he has reconciled us to God through his blood and has bought us out of the slave market of sin by the redemption that is in his blood. He was taken down from the cross. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. And on the third day, with all of the power that was inherent within him, not only did the Spirit raise him from the dead, but Christ raised himself from the dead. He said in John 10, 17, I have authority to lay my life down, and I have authority to take it back up again. No one took his life. His blood was not spilt. His blood was poured out intentionally upon the cross, and by his own supreme authority over death itself, he raised himself from the dead. We must continue. I want you to note fifth now, the demand of the gospel. We just saw the substance or the subject of the gospel. I want you to see in verse 5 now the demand of the gospel. He says to bring about the obedience of faith. And what we see here is that the gospel brings a demand upon everyone who receives it. The gospel is not a suggestion. The gospel is not an option. The gospel is even more than a free offer. The gospel is a command from God that demands our repentance that demands our faith, that demands our submission, that demands our allegiance, and demands our loyalty. 
And the one who truly believes in Jesus Christ is the one who has the obedience of faith. If there is no obedience, there is no faith. Because faith is not passive. Faith is active. And faith is stepping out as an act of the will and not only entrusting my life to Christ, but now becoming a follower of Christ. And I have put my life under the authority of Christ. And now for the rest of my life, I am given to obey the Lordship of Jesus Christ. This does not speak of the perfection of our life, but of the direction of our life. We are now no longer doing our own thing. We are now no longer following our own agenda. We now are those who are living in obedience to the Word of God and to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. John Stott, very uh, outstanding expositor who recently went to be with the Lord, writes at this point, Paul looked for a total unreserved commitment to Jesus Christ, which he called the obedience of faith. What did Jesus say in Matthew 7, verse 21? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. This is not saying that we earn salvation by our obedience, but it is saying if you have true saving faith, your life will be characterized by a continual, habitual, daily obedience to the Word of God. If you would, turn over to Romans 6 just for a moment. Romans chapter 6 and and verse 16 and 17. It's worth taking this in very quickly at this point. Romans 6 verse 16, Paul writes, Do you not know? And when he says, do you, do you not know? It's a rhetorical device, meaning if you have two brain cells that are touching between your ears, you know this. <laughs> do you not know? Can you think? Can you read? Can you reason? Can you draw the obvious conclusion? Verse 16, do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? Let me just say this before I continue. Everyone in this room is a slave. You're a slave of one of two masters. And no one here is free to do your own thing. You will live in obedience to one of two masters. And he goes on to define who these two masters are. Do you not know that when you present yourself to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? So the question is, who's your master? It's obvious. It's the one you obey. It's the one you live for. It's the one you follow. It's the one you submit to. That's who your master is. So he goes on to say, here are your two options. And there are only two options, not a third or a fourth. Either of sin resulting in death or obedience resulting in righteousness. That's the only explanation for what's going on in America right now. Slaves of sin, obeying sin, obeying the lusts and the vile passions of their flesh. They're obeying their master. And the only explanation for true believers and what sets them apart is that they obey a different master. They obey righteousness. They obey Jesus Christ who has provided this righteousness. So look at verse 17. Given these two options of verse 16, but thanks be to God 
that though you were slaves of sin, and that's true of every one of us in this room, in our past, we were all slaves of sin, whether you were born in the church or not, whether you just got, whether you have just recently become converted or not, we all entered this world with the chains of sin holding us in bondage to death. Even if you were sprinkled as a baby, even if you were confirmed and joined the church at age 12, if you had not yet come to faith in Jesus Christ, which would have been impossible for an infant, you were a slave of sin. And sin dictated to you. And sin dominated you. And sin was a cruel tyrant. You may have looked very nice and moral on the outside, but the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can understand it? So he says, thanks be to God, verse 17, that though you were, past tense, slaves of sin, note, you, referring to every believer, you, became obedient from the heart. You see, God gave you a new heart in the new birth. And when He regenerated you, He took away your heart of stone and He gave you a heart of flesh. And it is a heart that is alive unto God. It has a spiritual pulse for God. And it says He wrote His law on the tablet of His heart and put His Spirit within us and has caused us to keep His law. So look what it says. Thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching. Sound doctrine, high theology, biblical truth to which you were committed. So come back to Romans 1 and verse 5. No wonder Paul says at the very outset of this book, What's what's the demand of the gospel? It's not to walk forward. It's not to raise a hand. It's not to sign a card. It's not to join the church. It's not to join the choir. It's not to be a good person. That's That's not the evidence of true saving faith. It is the obedience of faith. So I want to ask you a very personal question. Are you living an obedient life? to the Word of God, and to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you, every time God says, you shall do this, God is saying, help yourself to happiness. And every time God says, you shall not do this, God is saying, do not destroy your life. God is such a good God. And with every command in his word, it is with a high purpose, not only for his glory, but for our good. Oh, I must hasten. Please note in verse 5, number 6, the scope, the scope of the gospel. He goes on to say, after he says to bring about the obedience of faith. No, here's the scope among all the Gentiles. This means all the nations, all the world, all peoples everywhere. In verse 14, he will speak of Greeks and barbarians. That means the learned and the unlearned, the civilized and the uncivilized. He will say in verse uh, verse 16, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Their Greek refers to non-Jew or Gentile. The scope of the gospel is this gospel must be proclaimed to every person in every city, in every county, in every state, in every nation, in every generation, in every place, from the pinnacle of society down to the dregs of society, every person in the world needs the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
The psalmist says in Psalm 96, verse 10, Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Matthew 28, 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Luke 24, 47, That repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. Very quickly, note the purpose of the gospel. Note, the, note if you would, the last four words of verse 5, for his name's sake. Why did Paul want to bring the gospel to the world? What was driving him? What was motivating him? What was energizing him? What was thrilling his soul? What was throwing his feet out of bed in the morning? What was putting wind in his sail? What was driving the engine within his, within his heart? What gave Paul such a, a supernatural dynamic about his soul? It was this, that everything was for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, that there would be one more soul in the hallelujah chorus to stand before the throne of grace and, and to sing of the glories of the Lamb upon his throne throughout all of the ages to come. It was never about Paul. It was never about his own ministry. It was always about Christ and the head of the church. And it devastated Paul when Christ was rejected. And it exuberated Paul when Christ was received. And, and so it is for us and with us. Nothing thrills the soul of a Christian more than Christ. That's what it is to be a Christian. It's Christ. It's to know Christ, worship Christ, follow Christ, adore Christ, serve Christ, preach Christ, share Christ, honor Christ. The whole Christian life is Christ. And no wonder he says, I do all of this for his namesake, for the fame of his name for the exaltation and the magnification of the honor and glory that so rightly belongs to him who laid down his life upon the cross. Let me conclude the last heading, number eight. Let me just tell you, don't ever preach an eight-point sermon. Uh, it's just too much, but uh, I only have one opportunity. So number eight, I want you to see the success of the gospel Verse 6 ought to cause everyone in this room to be so excited that you'd almost have to get up and walk around the room to let off nervous energy. If this doesn't light you up, as the old saying is, your wood is wet. Let me just tell you what verse 6 says. God himself guarantees the success of of his own gospel. God has his elect. God has his chosen ones. From before the foundation of the world, God has sovereignly set his heart of love upon those who are undeserving, upon his own people. He gave them to the Son to be His inheritance in eternity past, and He commissioned His Son to come into this world to lay down His life a ransom for many. And then the Father sent the Holy Spirit to call out of the world those whom the Father chose and those for whom the Son died, and it is guaranteed. Let me give you the P word. It is predestined that they will come to faith in Jesus Christ. Look at verse 6, among whom you also, the also means there's more than just you, among whom you also are the called, the called of Jesus Christ. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ today, I want to tell you, you are the called. And you know what the word church means, ecclesia, the called out ones. That's what church is. We are those who've been called out of the world by our sovereign spirit into fellowship with the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. There are two calls that are given in the Bible. There's the general call, which is the free offer of the gospel as the gospel is preached, and there is the effectual call of the gospel that ultimately triumphs in the hearts of all those for whom it is intended. Jesus will not die in vain. Jesus will have a bride. Jesus will be worshipped around His throne. There will be those for, for whom he has died that the Spirit of God will call, 
call from the four corners of the earth as the word of God goes forth, and they will, they will, they will believe. I love what Spurgeon says. He says, I love it when God says, they shall come. A man says he will do something, and what is it good for? He says he will do this, and he never does that. He says he will do this, and he never does this. But when God says, I will, he will. And he says that God will call from the four corners of the earth his chosen bride that he has given to his son. And Jesus has said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. My friend, we are living in desperate days. This thing is about to unravel before our very eyes. It's going to be a domino effect. And like someone dying in a hospital bed, when you get to that point, death comes so quickly. And we're going to be observing the death of a culture and the death of a society and the death of a nation. But we will never see the death of the church. We will never see the death of the gospel. And in the midst of the decadency, in the midst of the darkness, in the midst of the evil, let us have confidence in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God will guarantee its success. And those whom he foreknew, these he predestined. And whom he predestined, these he called. And whom he called, these he justified. And whom he justified, these he glorified. Those whom he began with in eternity past, he will meet in heaven in eternity future. There are no dropouts along the way. And there's no one added along the way. It is the golden chain of salvation. And this hope ought to burn brighter in our heart than ever before as the darkness is setting on the land. May the light of the gospel shine brighter than it has ever shined before, beginning in your heart and my heart. All glory to the God of the gospel. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, instill within us the truth of these opening verses of the book of Romans. Write them upon our hearts. Etch them in stone within our soul. Remind us of the power of the gospel. Remind us that it is the gospel that sets forth the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that even in these days of coming persecution, that those who say, Lord, Lord, will fall away. And it's only those who are given to the obedience of faith who will remain standing. We understand this will purify the church. It will strengthen the church because what will be left behind will be a pure bride in days of suffering and adversity. May we thrive like the first century church in the Roman Empire as Caesar will make his demands upon us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.